I'm Dr. Denise Hearn, Director of Research for the U.S. Poultry and Egg Association. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Katherine Logg regarding one of her current research projects funded by U.S. Poultry and its Foundation. Dr. Logg is a professor in the Department of Population Health within the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Georgia. Hi, Katherine. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to share your research with us today. Good morning and uh, greetings from a sunny Athens. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to chat with you today about our research, but I just want to start off by saying I do want to acknowledge and thank the U.S. Poultry and Egg for, for the support of our work. Absolutely. Thank you. So the study that we will be discussing today is titled Assessing the Impact of Feed Supplements on the Selection of Avian Pathogenic E. coli, commonly referred to as APEC. You and your team are considered one of the most active in APEC research and antimicrobial resistance of bacterial pathogens of animal and human concern. Can you begin by providing a brief overview of this project? Sure. Um, so our group has, you know, done this for probably 20, 30 years. I mean, it started with my colleague Lisa Nolan, and then it's kind of evolved that I've taken over some of that work and try to keep continuing to move it along. But for those of you in the industry or um, those of you that are poultry producers, I mean, APEC is a really big cause of loss to the industry every year. I mean, we're talking either morbidity, mortality, or even carcass condemnation. And, and it's a big challenge for the industry. And one of the challenges that we see is, and the reason why it's such a big challenge is because of the diversity of strains that cause the disease in the first place. Um, so trying to develop a vaccine is, is not easy because of the fact that the strains are so diverse. Um, and then of course, the alternative choice was to use antibiotics, uh, which of course are now limited. So the industry is always interested, I think, in alternatives or some more natural based approaches that might work. And what we're interested in looking at is maybe um, what, we're, what was seen elsewhere is, 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 is looking at metals and metal supplementation and, and how these may be drivers for the selections of certain kinds of APEC. So I think that's what we're really doing here is, is, is trying to understand really what makes APEC tick and what might actually be a selective agent that would um, affect it. Um, and then, you know, because of the pressure with the needs for alternative control measures for APEC, I mean, this is, this is part of the reason why, why we're doing what we're doing. Thank you. Um, and just to add on to the first question, why do you see this as an important and urgent need within the poultry industry? Well, I think, I think a lot of it is driven by um, what's happened with poultry production. Um, and like I mentioned a few minutes ago, the the, the diversity of strains that are causing the disease. Um, vaccines may not always be effective um, because they tend to target certain kind of sero groups or sero types um, so th that you might not get full protection. And then of course, trying to find alternatives to antibiotics, which of course are now limited because of the veterinary feed directive and other regulations. So the producer really doesn't have a huge arsenal of, of, of things to use anymore. Thank you. Are you able to provide us some details regarding the objectives you hope to explore and also your approach to accomplishing them? Sure, sure. So, I mean, this is a project that we hope to achieve over two years. Um, I, I think eventually we'll probably do a little further work beyond that. But what we'd like to do, first of all, is, is to take a look at what's out there. Um, so we're trying to screen some of our newer and older APEC strains. Um, to see what types of genotypes and phenotypes they have, especially as it pertains to the metals and metal resistance. Um, and then some of what we know already about that is, is, is what we have from previous work that our group has done. Um, so we have an idea what's out there, but we really want to get down to the nitty gritty and see what we have. Um, once we kind of get the screening method down and, and, and looking at what's their screening wise, then we'd like to kind of come back and and see where these things are from a genome point of view. In other words, if, if we sequence some, some of these strains, uh, where are these things located? Where are the metal resistances located? Are they on plasmids? Or are they on the chromosomes? And, and what, what is actually pretty common? And what keeps each other company? Um, and I'll, I'll share a screenshot with you in, in a second and show you what I'm, what I'm talking about here. And then we'd like to see if we can build up a core of information on that, You know, the core of what really are the common genes that are out there. And then, and then finally, what we'd like to do 
is come back and do some in vitro and in vivo studies. You know, if we knock these genes out, how do these APEC behave or can we, can we create targets for control? So I mentioned this a second ago and let me just give you a quick screen share on this. Uh, can you see this? Can you see it? The three circles? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so really when I, this is um, some previous work that our group has done and these are some plasmids that we pulled from some of these apex that we sequenced. And if you see this one here has a lot of silver, the, the one on the left, the middle one here has some copper and silver, silver genes in here. And this one on the right here is, um, is what we call a hybrid plasmid. So it's part virulence and part resistance but it's got some mercury in here. So, I mean, that's of interest to us is, is what's keeping each other company and, and what we should be worried about. Very good. Are you able to review for us how you identified which specific heavy metals to assess for resistance? Um, I think when we started out, we, we started going for the obvious ones that we'd seen in some of our earlier work. Um, and I've shown you those there on that plasmid. So things like the silvers, the coppers, the mercuries, and some of those have historically been used in poultry production for a while. So, I mean, they've been there. Um, I, I, you all remember the story of roxazone and the arsenicals, which were good coccidiostats and, and, and anti-helminth uh, kind of agents. So, I mean, we, we had some historical information. We know coppers have been used for years. And then, of course, things like silver and, and other things that are out there. I mean, even, even the environment and the soils may, may, be, may be a source of some of these metals. So I think um, when we started trying to design the study, we sort of built up on, on what we had and what we'd known and what's already in the literature. And then, of course, just, just went with the broad aspect of trying to cover a lot of the metals that are there with the idea, let's, let's, let's look at them all and let's see which ones are really common. Thank you. Another question, um, switching topics just a little bit. There is evidence from the swine industry showing how metal supplements may have promoted the selection of methicillin resistant Staph aureus, MS, MRSA. Yes, um, yes. This is of critical importance to the poultry industry as we begin to focus more interest in metals. Uh, can you elaborate just a little bit on this discovery and, and what the poultry industry should keep in mind regarding it? Well, I think, uh, and this goes back to, harkens back to some of my earlier work because uh, I've always been interested in drugs and bugs. Um, mm -hmm. So we did a lot of work on this when I, when I was further up north um, looking, at, looking at swine and, and swine production. But there was a lot of studies that came out in the probably the late 90s, early 2000s, where, where they were looking at MRSA and they were looking at specific strains of MRSA that, that pigs had, the, what they're called these livestock associated ST398 strains. And they found that there was a kind of a correlation between the presence of zinc genes on them. And, and when they started looking at what, between that and the strain types that they were finding and the, and the questions became asked, well, what, what, is the, what is the relationship here? And at some point it was discovered that a lot of these uh, young piglets are, are typically given a, a supplement or a shot of a, a zinc-based product. Um, and it's really to help post-weaning diarrhea. I mean, because otherwise you're gonna have a huge loss of young animals. So, um, but, but somehow or other this has translated that maybe there, there's a selection process by using this kind of a supplement or, or, or this, this injection in, in the pigs that caused it. And I think what, what we're looking at for the poultry industry is, is sort of to learn the lesson there that maybe, I mean, there's no guarantee that this would happen, but, but as we're looking for alternative antimicrobials that maybe we need to kind of remember the lesson from the swine and not have the same thing happen or, or at least be aware that, you know, do some of these metals actually select for the pathogens? And if so, how are they doing it? So I think by, by doing this type of study that I'm describing here, we would at least have an idea which metals are there, which ones could potentially be for selecting, or which ones could actually help to select for certain strains of, of APEC. I mean, this study is focused on APEC, but I don't know if we should even think further out and look at other avian pathogens, but for now, we'll just focus on the APEC and see how that goes. Mm -hmm. And thank you for providing some of that detail. I think this is going to be critically important for the poultry industry. And I just have a, a couple more questions for you here. Sure. Uh, what do you hypothesize will be the outcome of your work? Um, well, I think what I'd like to do is, is actually figure out how these metals interplay with, with APEC. I mean, are they there? Um, are they selected? 
Um, what does the effect down the line for the strains have? I mean, do, do they hold on to these things? Do they lose them? And um, if they're in supplements or if they're in feeds or if they're in water, are they selecting for, for more pathogenic and even potentially virulent strains? I mean, I showed you that circular there, those three circles a few minutes ago. The one on the very far right is actually what we call a hybrid plasmid. So it's kind of a combination of virulence and resistance. So if, if we've got those things there, or they've got those traits on those plasmids, are we actually selecting for those kind of strains? So my goal would be that at least we would have a better understanding of, of how APEC behaves, and then we could actually design better strategies for controlling it. Um, in other words, you know, finding out which metals would be of impact and which ones would not. And then hopefully we can use that as a way to, to eventually design better strategies for APEC. So from the industry perspective, I think giving them a broad understanding of what goes on, um, giving them an understanding from the, uh, you know, from the feed point of view or from the producer point of view that, you know, what goes into that feed or what, what, what could potentially be selecting for these agents and, and these pathogens as we go. And last question, um, who do you think will, will benefit from these findings or be able to utilize the findings of your work? Um, I, I think a couple of different areas would really benefit from this. Other poultry researchers that work in APEC would definitely appreciate understanding this or, or, or getting down to the basis of what, what goes on. I think the producers themselves, it would be a value for them, especially as they're all going to alternative antibiotic approaches right now, no antibiotics ever or, or organic approaches and, and, and trying to find alternative things that they can use for controlling these pathogens. So I think that would be really important for producers. But I also think even from the feed industry point of view, what, what these supplements may or may not be doing or how they may be impacting or selecting for, for certain pathogens would be really relevant. So I see that the, there's kind of a broad scope of where people could, could use this information. Very good. And those are the questions that I have for you today. I just want to thank you uh, very much for taking time out to, to share your research with us. I know myself, as well as the rest of the poultry industry, will be anxiously awaiting the findings and figuring out how we can apply those to our daily going abouts within the industry. And um, before we end, I'll just ask you uh, any final thoughts or anything else that you want to share uh, with the audience that you have today. Uh, well, again, just, just to thank the U.S. Poultry and Egg Association for their support of our work. It's really important and we really, really do appreciate the help um, of the producers in giving us information or giving us strains because understanding the current strains is really critical to, 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 to understanding how to diagnose and treat disease. So that's really of importance to us. And I do want to thank, thank those producers and, and, and those pr processes out there for those kind of strains, because I think that's really relevant. Um, and just the industry in general for their support and help. And of course, U.S. Poultry and Ag. Of course. And we appreciate you as well. Thank you so much for today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.